The first big battle of World War I was called the Battle of Tannenberg. The Russian Imperial Army was attacked by the German war machine. The most proximate reason was that this was a retaliation for the killing of Austrian Prince Duke Ferdinand. But the German military also wanted to establish who was the numero uno military power in Europe. This was a constant battle between the Russian Imperial Army on the one side and the German war machine. Eventually, this battle for Tannenberg, it lasted for about three weeks, much of August of 1914. Eventually, it resulted in a German victory. In fact, the Russian defeat in World War I was what led to the Russian Revolution in 1917, and thereby it ended 300 years of the great imperial kingdom of Russia. Today, over a hundred years later, once again, the fates of Russia and Germany are closely intertwined, and that is also because of another war. This time, the special military operation that Russia has launched on Ukraine. Since this war began, Germany has been the key country to watch out for. In fact, Germany is Europe's largest economy. It is the most important political player in all of continental Europe. Germany is in a unique position to bring pressure to bear on Vladimir Putin and Russia. But what we have seen so far is a reluctance to directly confront or call out Vladimir Putin. Germany still continues to buy about $200 million of oil from Russia every single day. That is even today, that is even after this special military operation has gone full throttle. It's going to be almost two months since it began. And this, the fact that Germany continues to economically support Russia, yet at the same time is at the forefront of the political opposition to this war, this is sparking a fierce debate, both within and outside Germany, about what the country should be doing to punish Putin and Russia more. On Crux Decode this week, can Germany be the fulcrum or the rallying point against Russia in Europe? Or is Germany way too pragmatic and coming across as too flaky to be the bulwark against Putin and Russia? Now, Germany has always been rather reluctant to directly confront the Kremlin. In the weeks leading up to this current special military operation in Ukraine, Germany, in fact, was called the weak link. All that seemed to change when Putin decided to send his forces into Ukraine. Three days after this war was announced, on the 27th of February, the new German Chancellor Olaf Scholz gave a speech in which he called this invasion a Zeitenwende, which means a turning point in German foreign policy. Now, while Germany was still open to negotiations with Russia, Scholz, in his speech to the nation at that time, said that they're not going to be talking to Russia simply for the sake of talking. And some of the steps that were taken by Germany in the early days of the war really were indeed a turning point. The government cancelled the $11 billion Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. That was, of course, a prestige project, both for Berlin and for Moscow. Scholz also boosted defense spending to 2% of GDP. That's in line with what NATO has prescribed for all its members. Also, Germany added 100 billion euros in new spending on military investments through for the next few years. Now, this $100 billion is more than double of Germany's entire defense budget for 2021. Germany also began supplying anti-tank and air defense missiles to Ukraine, overturning a long-standing policy, a policy that it was following since the Second World War, of not sending weapons into conflict zones. But what was a significant shift for Germany was not necessarily good enough for the rest of the NATO alliance. Indeed, it appears that the Zeitenwende has its own limits. Now, one crucial limit is in sharp focus over the last few months. Germany will not stop sending all those oil and gas payments to Moscow. In fact, Germany has opposed any proposal to impose an oil embargo against Russian exports. In fact, the finance minister of Germany, Christian Lindner, 
has said that if this embargo were to be imposed, then it would inflict more damage in Germany than it would on Russia. For all its strong rhetoric, Germany is still effectively subsidizing Russia's war with energy payments. Now, there is no shortage of historic bad blood between Russia and Germany. It goes back several centuries, but in the years following the end of the Cold War, relations between Berlin and Moscow grew pretty steadily. In fact, Moscow supported the reunification of East and West Germany, and Berlin generally backed post-Soviet Russia's reintegration into mainstream Europe and into the global economy. That reintegration seemed nearly complete back in 2001 when the newly minted president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, who had served as a KGB agent in Dresden in Germany during the fall of the Berlin Wall, he gave a speech to the Bundestag, the German parliament, and he spoke in nearly flawless German, which took everybody by surprise. He declared Russia a friendly European nation. The Chancellor of Germany at that time, Gerhard Schroeder, described Putin as a flawless democrat. Schroeder was later rewarded after his chancellorship with very lucrative positions at several Russian state-owned energy companies. Now, things were not quite so chummy when Angela Merkel took office. She took office in 2005. In fact, Putin very famously brought his Labrador Retriever to his very first meeting with Angela Merkel. And everybody at that point of time had known that Angela Merkel had a well-known fear of dogs. But both Merkel and Putin developed a business-like rapport. Uh, Merkel, who had grown up in communist East Germany, developed a reputation as the person who would be called the Putin Whisperer. She was the one across all of Europe's leaders who could actually stand up and talk to Putin and Putin would listen to her. In fact, German-Russian relations soured a bit after 2014, after Russia's annexation of Crimea and the imposition of European sanctions on Moscow. But even in 2014, even in this Anna's Horribilis that it turned out to be, Putin spoke with Merkel 35 times. That is with more than any other leader that he had spoken in that entire year. According to the Russian investigative journalist Mikhail Zyagan, in a New York Times op-ed piece, Merkel was the only Western leader that Mr. Putin took seriously. Now, the Putin whisperer that is Merkel is gone. Germany has a new chancellor in Olaf Scholz. His party, the Social Democrats, they have long favored friendly ties with Russia, but Scholz governs in a coalition. He has the Green Party as his coalition partner, which is tooth and nail opposed to the Nord Stream project. And so far, they have been much more skeptical than any other mainstream political party in Germany. So the tilt that we're seeing, the more hawkish tilt that we're seeing from the new German government, in part is being attributed by pressure from the Green Party. But there's also a practical reason why Scholz is going slow. Energy sales account for about a third of the Russian government's budget. But energy is a weapon that cuts both ways. In fact, before the war, Germany relied on Russia for more than 50%, more than half of its natural gas, more than 50% of coal, and about a third of the oil that was consumed in Europe's largest economy. In the country's energy equation, Scholz has warned that an immediate cutoff or an embargo on Russian oil and gas would mean that Germany would be plunging not just itself, but all of Europe into a recession. In fact, a Goldman Sachs assessment has predicted that a complete embargo or a cutoff of the Russian pipeline would ensure that German GDP growth would be cut down by at least three percentage points. And that, after two years of the pandemic, is something that even the biggest economy in Europe can ill afford. The government claims to be working to alter its dependence on Russian energy sources. In fact, according to the economy minister, Robert Habeck, Germany has cut Russian oil imports from a third to about a quarter. This is a quarter of all the total oil and gas imports that it has made. But under the current targets, it will only be able to wean itself off Russian imports by the middle of 2024. And by that time, 
Ukraine may not even exist as a nation, leave alone which way this war might actually eventually end.